Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome to another live edition of our program as could that during another blessed day in a blessed month of Ramadan by the grace of Allah today is the 20th of Ramadan uh, in the Middle East uh, while in North America and in many other parts of the world it is the 21st of Ramadan and our phone numbers beginning with the area code are 002 then 0100546 Alternatively, a record 002, then 0238551132. And the WhatsApp number for calls only, no messages, a record 001347806025. And as usual, we begin by seeking the help of Allah and sending the peace and the blessings upon Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. May Allah teach us what we don't know and guide us to what is best. Amen. Uh, the first question we have is. Uh, from Adnan Ali who says how do I pray the Fajr Sunnah in the Masjid should I pray first Tahiyatul Masjid then the Fajr Sunnah no in fact Tahiyatul Masjid or what is known as the Turak as the greeting for every Masjid is whenever you enter any Masjid and before you sit down you should pray so if you happen to enter between the Adhan and before the Iqama so there is a sunnah before every father prayer. So if you pray the sunnah, that would waive the requirement of praying tahiyyatul masjid. The tahiyya means a greeting. You shouldn't sit down before praying. So if you happen to join the fard namaz or the fard prayer, in this case, you already prayed. If you enter earlier and you pray the su sunnah or any nafila, that will waive the requirement of praying an independent two rakahs of tahiyatul masjid. So you'll be only required to pray two rakahs, the sunnah for fajr. Barakallahu fikum. Uh, yes, Lorenz, alhamdulillah, we're back uh, uh, online and also we're having the phone lines working. Alhamdulillah, wa shukrullah. Thank you so much, my dear respected brothers and sisters, for supporting this great cause. May Allah accept from all of us. Uh, Sister Mariam Romana, she's asking, what is the ruling on a person who cut his friend's hair first, then his, after the completion of all the Umrah obligations out of forgetfulness? There is nothing wrong with giving another person a haircut while in a state of ihram, whether out of forgetfulness or deliberately. There is nothing wrong with giving oneself a haircut or using the razor to shave your head if you've done <coughs> the pillows of the Umrah already. In other words, the Umrah consists of Ihram, Tawaf, and Sa'i. So if you've done your Sa'i, you're finished. And now you're ready to do Tahallul, yani to shave or trim your hair. Do you have to go to a barber or find somebody who is not in Ihram to give you a haircut? Not at all. Any person, whether in a state of ihram or not in a state of ihram, including you yourself, can give yourself a haircut in order to do tahallul. It was restricted to remove any hair from your body while you were in a state of ihram. But after completing the pillars of Umrah, or in the case of Hajj, returning from Arafah and throwing the stones, you're already ready for tahallul. And the halul will not be achieved unless if you do a haircut or shave your head. So if you do it for yourself in this time, it is definitely permissible. I know this is one of the biggest leading uh, misconception when it comes to the tahallul in Umrah or Hajj. You don't need a barber or somebody else to give you a haircut. Any person, even in Ihram or you yourself, once you finish the manasik, you can do tahallul for yourself. All right. Um, 
Assalamu alaikum, Sister Bushra from the USA. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My question is about star timing. We have about two or three masjids in our area, and they all have different star timings. So the question is, is it okay just to follow Google uh, sunset time according to your zip code, or um, just follow any of the masjids? Okay. If it is, uh, if Google uh, sunset time is accurate based on your observation, I mean, in the States, if you just drive out of town, you can definitely realize what is sunset and what uh, time is sunset. So if it is uh, accurate based on your observation and the confirmation of others, you can simply follow the Google sunset. What is needed is once it is sunset, you break your fast. Some masajid, I understand that they take precautions and they prolong the time five minutes and ten minutes. That is not permissible. The sunnah is to break your fast once it is sunset. Got it, Sister Bushra? Okay. You sound like you're driving. Yes. I am. I am. Yeah. Okay. So in uh, in a few hours you can uh, drive out of town and observe the beautiful sunset in the field, and look at your Google uh, sunset time. If it is right. if it is uh, accurate, then you just follow it. Okay. Yeah. No. The the question is not about you know uh, while you're on travel. The question is more like I understand. The house. I understand. Like you're talking you're about house. using your zip code. Right. Yes. So this is just okay. to just to give you comfort because you're saying okay. that the uh, I believe it should be accurate, but the massage yeah the massage take precautions. Uh, you know some elders they do that, as well as they let people observe fasting 15 minutes before dawn. That's why in the timetable they have the five daily prayers, and they have for fajr before fajr they have something called imsak. This is where and when you stop eating and drinking and you stop fasting. That is not actually true. The imsak, when you stop eating and drinking, is the exact time for fajr. Whenever it is the adhan, all the time for the adhan of fajr. Thank you, Sister Bushar from the USA. And um, Sister Um Hamza from the KSA. Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to Ask with Sister Um Hamza. Sheikh, Sheikh uh, I have two questions. Please. Uh, number one is uh, if I have to choose 10 surahs to teach my kids with meaning, and also for myself, if I have to understand the subseed of 10 surahs, could you please give a list of most important surahs, the 10 most important surahs of, from the Quran? Which should they be? Okay, that's a good question. Thank and you, second, Sister. Uh, sorry? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, second, uh, since we are in the last 10 days of Ramadan, what would uh, your advice be? Uh, how can we make the best of these 10 days as well as 10 nights? All right. Thank you. Some Thank you, time. Sister. I'm Hamza from the KSA. First of all, with regards to choosing 10 surahs to render tafsir, the entire Quran from cover to cover is the word of Allah the Almighty. Okay? Um, Sometimes Allah the Almighty gives preference to a particular surah over others or an ayah over others because of the contents of the verse. For instance, the greatest ayah, the greatest verse of the entire Quran is Ayatul Kursi because of how it covers you know, the traits and the beautiful names of the Almighty Allah. And this is very important for the believers to learn the unity of the names and attributes of Allah. The greatest chapter of the Quran is Surah Al-Fatiha. Surah Al-Ikhlas represents one-third of the uh, Quran. Surah Al-Mulk uh, reverses that if you recite them, if you recite it every night before going to sleep, that will protect you against the torment of the grave. So if I'm going to learn the tafsir of 10 surahs at a time, I will begin with the following. The verses and the surah which have virtues which I like to memorize so that I will be reciting very often in the prayer. I begin with the beginning of the book, Surah Al-Fatiha, then Ayat Al-Kursi, and the small, the short chapters of the Quran which I have memorized or I'm working on memorizing so that when I recite, they will help me to gain 
concentration and khushu' in the prayer. Uh, with regards to the advices concerning the last uh, 10 nights of Ramadan, we said the night is superior to the daytime in Ramadan because of the witnessing of what is known as the grand night. It is one of those nights. And in the beginning of the program, I deliberately said in the Middle East, today is the 20th of Ramadan. In North America, today is the 21st of Ramadan. Uh, Ramadan. When my kids will be traveling from here to the States, they will get to break their fast a day earlier. What I meant by doing so is to bring to your attention that do not take chances. Do not say tonight is the first odd night or the night of the 21st. Because <clears throat> we all know for certain that there is only one moon. So when it is sighted somewhere, that means it has been born. But no one is blameworthy. If you try to sight the moon and it didn't show, then you're fine. Go ahead and break your fast tomorrow. And this is for the beginning of Ramadan. So in the Middle East, today is the 20th of Ramadan. Somewhere else, it is the 21st of Ramadan. You as a believer, you don't take chances because the Ahadith name that Laylat al-Qadr, the grand night, will be on the odd nights. Yani the, the night of the 21st in the Middle East in a couple hours it will begin the night of the 21st at sunset today on Tuesday it will be the night of the 21st that's why most people are observing Atikaf will enter their masjid tonight before sunset, before Maghrib to witness the night from the beginning but what about those who fasted the day earlier because they were able to sight the moon for me, I will consider the whole 10 nights not odd, not even, the whole 10 nights, blessed. And it's an opportunity which is not to be missed. When Allah Almighty says, Laylatul Qadri khayrun min alfi shahr. With a simple calculation, the 1,000 months represent 83 years and 4 months, which is a whole lifespan. Allah the Almighty means by that the worship which is observed on that grand night is better and superior to a constant worship which is observed day and night for a period of 83 years and 4 months. If somebody has been fasting on every single day for 83 years, has been praying for the entire night for 83 years, non-stop, witnessing Laylat al-Qadr while you are awake, in worship is better than all of that. So what we need to do is focus. What do I need to do? Waste no time whatsoever. Some sisters who happen to have their menses and they won't be able to pray. The greatest worship on that night is the night prayer. Whether taraweeh or tahajjud or general nawafil. Two by two and by the end you pray the witch. One rak'ah or three altogether. Okay? What about our dear sisters who have the menses and they won't be able to pray? Not a problem. The dhikr is a great alternative. And you keep sitting making adhkar, supplications, istighfar, or even recite Quran by memory if you have memorized. Okay? And make dua. Given in a charity beginning from tonight, Every night, every night, do not miss a single night. You, your spouse, your children, ask them to give in a charity. Quantity doesn't matter. What matters is that you give in a charity on a night which maybe it is a night of Al-Qadr. You pray Tahajjud on a night which is maybe one of, uh, you know, the night of the Qadr. Uh, you recited Quran, you recited Adhkar, you made Istighfar, you made Dua, all of that. I like to add to that, you know, using your phone, not to waste your time with the social media, but to contact your family members, wish them a happy and blessed Ramadan, make dua for them with the intention of upholding the ties of kinship. If you're observing i'tikaf, the i'tikaf is to be observed only in a masjid in which we pray the five daily prayers and the jumu'ah. I'tikaf shouldn't be observed in a little musallah where we pray 
uh, you know, beneath the building or the basement, but we don't pray Jumu'ah. Because you don't leave the i'tikaf to attend the Jumu'ah somewhere else. So also that would lead us to the understanding of i'tikaf for women in their houses or in their bedrooms. There is no such thing. The i'tikaf and to receive the reward for observing i'tikaf if you observe it in the masjid. In Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah the Almighty said, وَلَا تُبَاشِرُوهُنَّ وَأَنْتُمْ عَاكِفُونَ فِي الْمَسَاجِدِ I know that there is in one madhab an opinion that women can do i'tikaf at their houses, but the ayah is very clear. وَأَنْتُمْ عَاكِفُونَ فِي الْمَسَاجِدِ The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam observed i'tikaf only in the masjid. The mothers of the believers observed i'tikaf either along with the Prophet or after his death, only in the masjid, no i'tikaf at home. And the masjid in which we attend the five daily prayers and the Jumu'ah prayer. I'tikaf doesn't have minimum time, which means those who don't have an access to remain for the entire 10 days and 10 nights in I'tikaf, do not waste the opportunity. I love what the Arabs say. They say, مَا لَا يُدْرَكُ كُلُّهُ لَا يُدْرَكُ جُلُّهُ Which means, if you fail to achieve a target entirely, at least do not lose it or fail it entirely. Achieve as much as you can of it. So the target is to witness Laylat al-Qadr, but because I go to work, I take care of my parents, I have younger sisters, I cannot stay in i'tikaf fully. I stay in i'tikaf partially. I believe you guys go to pray Taraweeh and perhaps the Hajjid too beginning from tonight. The moment you set your foot in the masjid, intend i'tikaf. Is that right? Would that work? But it's only three hours. It is not even 24 hours. There is no minimum. You enter with the intention of i'tikaf. You pray Isha, Taraweeh, and Tahajjud. If you leave for after Fajr for work or uh, for to take care of your business, the time that you spent in the masjid counts as i'tikaf. Whenever you are in i'tikaf, there are some weak narrations about the verses of observing i'tikaf and how far it takes you and distance you from hellfire and all of that, it is enough to learn that every single moment that you're spending in the masjid counts. Every single dhikr. Let me give you a quick example. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Brother Anwar from Ethiopia. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to the program, Brother Anwar. Go ahead. Thank you. You're welcome. Go ahead, Brother. Uh, I'm listening. I have a question. I have two questions, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, my first question is, how is it to be seen in Islam, uh, the, the celebration of the milad of the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you know, the day of birth of the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Sallallahu And um, my, second, my second question is, uh, is it uh, to be said, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, loudly, when you're praying uh, the first salat, or uh, is it said, like, quietly? Okay. Zakallahu khayran, barakallahu feek. You know, Assalamu alaikum, Sister Asya from the KSA. Assalamu alaikum, Assalamu wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sheikh, I have three questions. Uh, question, uh, question number one uh, Suppose, uh, uh, I mean, someone cannot uh, go, I'm talking about the female, uh, to Tarabi also and Lailakul Qadr also. Two times cannot go to the masjid. So which will be the uh, one time uh, she can go? So which will be the best preferable time to go? Either for the, uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, for the Tahajjud or for the Tarabi? Uh, mm -hmm. uh, tahajjud start at 1 o'clock here in Saudi Arabia. Okay. Uh, so yeah, question number two is, uh, uh, someone, uh, someone said that it is, a, uh, though uh, we have a messages from Huda TV and all, and I have heard from you also, uh, Sheikh, that uh, uh, doing all the good things that is making uh, a sunnah namaz and doing charity 
and whatever the good thing what we do it uh, throughout the month of Ramadan, it will be more beneficial if we do in the last ten nights. But some of the sheikh had said that uh, it, this is not from Sunnah, and no need. Or, or, I mean, no need to sticking that. I mean, I was so confused. And uh, question number three is re it is not re related to Ramadan. It is some other topic. The thing is that you know, in some countries, in uh, especially in non-Muslim countries, every non-Muslim they worship their Lord with a fire. Either they burn the candles or do something other. You must be knowing she. So in Hindus, they burn a, a typical type of a lamp that is called a chirag. I mean, it is a typical type of lamp, which we Muslims don't keep it in our masjid. We also switch on the lights and all. We have a, a fanus and all in olden days, but we don't keep that of that. In the uh, in worshiping, they do that. Now, what they are making a trick is that, that in not worshipping, they are not worshipping idols, but any inauguration they are just keeping it lamb, but their intention is to keep, continue that tradition. And for that such organization and for that such ceremony, they call the Muslim candidate to do it. And people are willingly going and giving a lot of argument. And they are saying it is just like cutting the ribbon what you are doing in the Muslim country. Mm. Please give a proper clarification. Jazakallah khair. All right. Thank you, Sister Asya, from the case A. Uh, our brother from Ethiopia who asked about, uh, first of all, celebrating the birth of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Would you celebrate the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam through the practice of every sunnah? Now we're talking about i'tikaf. You heard me a few minutes ago. I said enough to know that the Prophet Sallallahu observed i'tikaf, seek Laylat al-Qadr. That is how we celebrate the presence and the prophethood and the birth of the Prophet Sallallahu And that applies to every sunnah, uh, eating with your right hand, entering the masjid with the right foot, uh, exiting from uh, the masjid with the left foot, entering the khala with the left foot, these are the actual commemorations of the remembrance of the Prophet Sallallahu um, Alaihi Wasallam. Sister Asya had a few questions. If a woman have a choice to go only once to the masjid, either to go for taraweeh or to go later for tahajjud, I would definitely choose to go for taraweeh. Number one, because in this case, you would ha you'll get to pray Isha in congregation. Okay, the Faridah. And it will be followed by the witch, by the uh, Taraweeh. And normally the Imam prays the witch, and there will be another Imam who will lead the Tahajjud. What is the benefit of attending the first? First and second, it's all virtuous. But the first, because Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said in the Hadith, whoever joins his Imam until he finishes the prayer, it will be recorded for him the reward of praying for the whole night. So actually, if you do that, and if you join the Isha and Taraweeh, until the Imam finishes, this reward is guaranteed. Then you can pray Tahajjud on your own in the masjid in uh, uh, at home, insha'Allah Azza Jal. She also brought up the issue that some people say it is not proper to give precedence and to uh, do a lot of good deeds more in the last 10 days or 10 nights of Ramadan than the rest of Ramadan. All Ramadan is uh, equal and it's all virtuous. I couldn't but disagree because we have plenty of references that proves the opposite. Take for instance, Aisha radiallahu anha, the mother of the believers, may Allah be pleased with her narrating that كان يجتهد رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم في العشر الأواخر ما لا يجتهد في غيرها. The Prophet peace be upon him used to make an effort in worship in the last ten of Ramadan, last ten nights of Ramadan, which he wouldn't do in any other time, including the first and the middle ten days and nights of Ramadan. As far as the daytime or fasting anyway. But in the last ten nights of Ramadan, special extra worship, and that is also deduced from the hadith that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he used to wake up his entire family which he would not do or not necessarily do in the first uh, in the second ten days of Ramadan but in the last ten nights of Ramadan he would do so 
he would wake up his entire family which means he will stay up without sleep for the entire night until dawn he used not to do that in any other night of Ramadan but only in the last 10 nights of Ramadan Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Azura from Malaysia Azura Assalamu alaikum Sheikh Wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Welcome to ask with the sister Azura yeah, uh, yeah, actually, I would like to ask because um, uh, uh, in the masjid in where I'm staying, um, during itikaf time, usually uh, the men will be there and um, women are not there. So is it proper if I go and uh, perform itikaf, especially uh, during night and uh, wait until tahajud and fajr time? Mm -hmm. Okay, I got your question. Uh, it's is it or it's advisable to just um, do all the prayers at home? Okay, so Azura, if there is a designated area for the ladies to do i'tikaf, yes, it is permissible to perform i'tikaf, and you will be rewarded for that. Why? Because the wives of the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, did observe i'tikaf in the masjid during his life and after his death, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. That is one thing. Secondly, I am as a man, I can pray taraweeh and tahajjud at home. But why it is preferred to do it in the masjid? It is much more encouraging to pray with the congregation. At home, many things could distract your attention. Okay, you could feel sleepy, you could grab something to eat that would waste some time in, 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 in the middle. But in the masjid, it is very encouraging especially if you have an imam who recites with a melodious voice, he keeps you awake, he keeps you in a state of khushu' and so on. So if you have an access to observe i'tikaf, sister Azura, do that. You have a beautiful country, and you have beautiful masajid, mashaAllah, and they have designated areas for the ladies and the sisters upon going to the masjid, they wear the beautiful hijab, the proper hijab. I'm talking about Malaysia and Indonesia, and most specifically Malaysia, I'm fully aware of that. So seize this opportunity to the point that if you cannot stay fully the 24 hours or day and night for the past 10 days and nights of Ramadan, go for Isha and Taraweeh and Tahajjud with the intention of observing Atikaf. To continue with the advices that Umm Hamza is asking, we have people in Atikaf, how do they eat? How do they drink? They either bring their food with them or the masjid offers the food. If I'm well off, I go to the management of the masjid and say, how many people are in Atikaf? We have uh, 100 people. I like to bring the iftar or the suhoor or iftar and suhoor meal for everybody. This is like, you know, the, one of the smartest thing that you can do with regards to the charity. Imagine. The reward on Laylatul Qadr is better than the reward which is offered in 83 years. So the reward will be multiplied, the amount, the quantity, and the quality for feeding, fasting people, and they are in i'tikaf and in the masjid. It's a very smart move. Those of you who have an access to do that, do it and do not hesitate. I bet you when you go to the masjid, they will say too late because the 10 nights are already booked. Okay, what about suhoor? Booked as well. Maybe you can get them bites or snacks or tea or coffee or dates between uh, the rakahs and taraweeh or sweet. Do that. The, the charity during. If you can do it here, send it overseas. Uh, you trust some people who can actually feed people during uh, i'tikaf in their mu'takaf. Uh, do that. Last before we take a break, Sister Asya and also Muhamza. I want to give you an indication of how one can benefit of the multiplication of the reward during the last 10 nights of Ramadan. We know in the hadith that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said the best of dhikr is to say la ilaha illallah. And in another he said that whoever says la ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika lah lahu al-mulk wa lahu al-hamdu wa huwa ala kulli shay'in qadir. Very simple, very simple. You say it 100 times, you receive the reward of setting free 10 slaves from the offspring of Ismail You know, 
if you do that on the night of Al Qadr and it coincides Laylat Al Qadr, the reward will not be 10, it will be 300,000. So, what is the significance of freeing slaves anyway? Is something very virtuous in Islam. The Prophet said, you know, whenever there were slaves, whoever frees a slave for the sake of Allah without any compensation, he frees with every body part of this slave a body part of his from hellfire. So you free the whole slave, you paid for it or for her totally. It costs you a hundred grams or whatever, and he said you guys are free, you just freed your entire body from hellfire. Imagine for doing so, La ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika lah, lahu al mulku wa lahu al hamdu wa huwa ala kulli shayin qadir. 100 times you receive the reward if it is Laylatul Qadr of freeing 300,000 slaves from the offspring of Prophet Ismail. And more and more to be continued, inshallah, but only when we return from taking a short break. Please stay tuned. The best stories are the stories mentioned in the Quran. The best speech is the speech of Allah in the Quran. And the best of all other human beings are the messengers of Allah. We would listen, inshallah ta'ala, to some beautiful recitations from verses in the Quran that talks about the messengers of Allah. Join us in Quran Circle 4. We will do all of this. Yeah. So probably you are going to, you are doing this job, so perfect it. And this is part of our great religion is mm. perfection. And perhaps mm. there is another chapter about this. Perfect right. your work. Give mm -hmm. the right to the job that you have.
welcome you, moms. We all adore. We pray for happiness. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back. Uh, our brother from Ethiopia had a second question uh, before we start taking uh, any more calls. He asked about the basmala and reciting Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim out loud in the beginning of the prayer or in the recitation uh, if the Imam is leading the prayer. So there is actually a difference of opinion with regards to the recitation of the basmala out loud for the imam because the prophet sallallahu alaihi in the hadith of anas ibn malik radiyallahu an used not to recite it out loud but in some narrations he did but most of his recitation he would recite it quietly then he would begin the recitation as anas ibn malik said whether the prophet or abu bakr or umar by saying alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen and it doesn't mean that he used not to recite the basmala, but he would not recite it out loud. Barakallah feek. According to Imam Shafi'i, may Allah have mercy on him, it is sunnah to recite the basmala out loud because he considers it indeed an ayah of every surah and particularly of surah Al-Fatiha. Assalamu alaikum. Sister Umm Mustafa from Bahrain. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to Ask Koda Sister. Uh, I just wanted to know that uh, is it compulsory to be in the state of uh, fasting when we do uh, at the Kaab or we can do it after offering uh, Isha and Tarawi? Okay, barakallahu fiki. Yes, I did answer this question a little earlier that at night, of course, there is no fasting. So there is a partial i'tikaf and there is no minimum time for it. So you can come to the masjid with the intention of praying Isha Tarawih and Tahajjud and also observing I'tikaf. Barakallahu feek. Um, the following question is from Discard Bakr. He says, how can, pay, how can one pay his zakat al fit if he is incarcerated? Is his wife allowed to pay on his behalf? Yes, sir she is and any person wants to pay zakat al-fitr on behalf of another they just need to let them know that i will be paying zakat al-fitr on your behalf like if i want to pay for all my brothers and sisters and for my parents and for my children even though each and every one of them is living in his own flat that's perfectly fine and that would waive the requirement for them to pay zakat al-fitr but I would have to let them know before I pay it so that it is dispensed with the intention of Zakat al-Fitr. Okay. Um, Sister Sarah is asking, can you give to your own sibling Zakat? Do you have to mention to the receiver that it is Zakat? The answer is, yes, you may give to your sibling Zakat if they're eligible, if they're poor. And you don't have to specify upon giving the zakat to the recipient that this is 
zakah. As long as it is your intention that this is zakah, that is satisfactory. Assalamu alaikum. Brother Zubair from USA. Assalamu alaikum, ya Zubair. I'm doing fine, alhamdulillah. Thank you for asking, sir, brother. I have one question. Yes. No problem. So actually, sir, I'm uh, applying for the software developer jobs, and you know, uh, most of the companies they make software for the for, for the banks and insurance companies, and you like, you know, it's it's clear, you know, everybody do that. So is it uh, allowed to work for the software companies? Like, you know, you know that they're gonna, you know, they're gonna make you do those jobs too. Okay, I got your question. Second ayah of Surah Al-Ma'idah, chapter number 5, answers this question, in which Allah Almighty says, وَتَعَاوَنُوا عَلَى الْبِرِّ وَالتَّقْوَى وَلَا تَعَاوَنُوا عَلَى الْإِثْمِ وَالْعُدُوَانِ At ta'awun, which is cooperation, helping, assisting, even via working for somebody and earning your living out of that, is only in what is lawful, what is good. But working for somebody, helping or assisting, while getting paid or voluntarily for free, in anything which is unlawful, is unlawful as well. If I know that a program which I am designing is designed exclusively for uh, a firm that deals with riba, to calculate the interest rate and all of that, I'm not supposed to do that. It is not permissible. But designing a program which benefits Google, which benefits Amazon, which benefits whatever, I design a program, and then other companies may take the program modified and to benefit out of it, and those companies or firms may be conventional banks, insurance companies, but the program is not to serve a particular purpose for the uh, task which is not permissible. Barakallah feek. In this case, it is different. Yani, if I design a program generally and for, for all companies, and it is not to do a service which is haram, then it is halal. Whether those who purchase it from the other suppliers are uh, doing a lawful work or unlawful work is none of your business. But when I'm assigned to develop a program or a service for a firm which is doing haram, then I'm assisting them. Assalamu alaikum. Hidayah from Bangladesh. Assalamu alaikum, Hidayah. Wa alaikum salam, Sheikh. I hope you're doing well. I'm doing wonderful. Alhamdulillah. Thank you for asking. Uh, uh, I have two questions, Sheikh. Uh, my first question is. Um, if a non-Muslim brother, if I'm like talking to a non-Muslim brother and Alhamdulillah like convinced him that Islam is the truth and he gave the Shahada to me, so is there any specific reward according to the Sunnah for me? Of uh, course. That's my first question. Of course. So my second question is, mm. okay, uh, second question is, uh, what is the ruling for men uh, dyeing their hair apart from black? Like nowadays I see many Muslim teenagers uh, dyeing their hair blonde, so specifically blonde. Is there like any ruling against it or for it? Is it allowed? All right, barakallahu feek, zakallahu khairan. Obviously, in the sound hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said to Amir al-Mu'minin Ali ibn Abi Talib, may Allah be pleased with him, O Ali, ud'uhum ila shahadati an la ilaha illallah. Call them to believe in the oneness of Allah, since indeed, if Allah guides through you, one person, that would be better for you than in one narration, the sound narration, that it camels, which is a great deal of wealth. In another narration, better for you than the whole world and what it contains. You save somebody from hellfire, then every good deed this person will be doing, praying, fasting, reading Quran, he will be rewarded and you get a similar word because it happened through you, okay? Dyeing the hair, if the person's hair turns gray, it is a sunnah to dye it with natural dye or artificial as long as it, it is not, uh, you know, something that uh, harms. 
And uh, the Prophet وسلم, only put one restriction, which is to avoid the black. Okay? What you're asking about is something different. The youth dyeing their hair, those funny colors, uh, to go the fashion and models and all of that, that is not permissible because you're not supposed to imitate those people. You're supposed to look modest. You're supposed to be modest. Okay, so the Prophet ﷺ prescribed the changing of the hair color if it is gray, if it is white. For a woman who dyes her hair for her husband in any color, that is permissible. Okay, barakallahu feekum. Again, to avoid the black dot. We have uh, a long question from Sister Fahmida Begum, if I'm saying the, uh, the name correct. Uh, she's asking to make dua for her and her husband to perform Hajj this year. And let me just uh, compress her question because there is a little introduction. Then she's saying that after many years of trying to go for Hajj, now Alhamdulillah they applied with a private company and they're going. But she has mixed feelings. She wants to go for Hajj for the pleasure of Allah, but she's afraid that she will be uh, showing off or whatever and that's why she's feeling reluctant okay if you're planning to do any good deed any good deed not just hajj do not let that fear stop you because if you're afraid you will be showing off so you quit quitting is a pleasure to, sh to satan and it is equivalent to shirk no you're planning to do an act of worship proceed towards it especially hajj if it is your first hajj you have to do it it is a pillar so once you have the opportunity do not hesitate to seize it go ahead and perform hajj may allah accept assalamu alaikum sister maya from the usa yeah, assalamu alaikum how are you wa alaikum assalam wa barakatuh welcome back sister maya yeah first, first of all i want to go to your song for succeeding you today for this test thank you Barakallahu fiki. Appreciate that. And uh, I have uh, no problem. I um, have one, um, one question. It might not sound like a question, but I'm going to go ahead. Uh, I have been frequenting like two mosques where I live at. And I've been seeing like, if I can say like uh, on Sunday school, like 50% of the women and students, they do not wear like the timar. Um, so maybe you, since you have lived in the USA, is that because we live in the United States that we just live as everybody else is living, or is not a requirement? S Sister Maya, as long as you're wearing the. Sister Maya, can you hear me? Hello. Can you hear me? Your voice is breaking off Hello? badly. Your voice is breaking off. Oh. I I can barely understand uh, the question. I... Okay. You want to say yeah, that again? I'll, I'll come back later then. Okay, go ahead. I'll come back later. Go ahead. Ah, so. okay. I was saying, since you have lived in the USA, and um, I'm, like, I've been going to the mosque, and most of the women and the kids at the Sunday school, they do not wear the khima. Mm. Some of them that dress appropriately, and some not. I just want to know by our curiosity, is it because we live in the U.S. that it's okay not to wear the khimar? Or, I mean, I talk to the leaders of the mosque, and, I mean, I haven't seen any improvement, and they're so free mixing and everything, so I'm like, maybe I'm the one who do not... Mm. Okay. So, I believe I got your point, Sister Maya. You no. have, um, you're having a concern that some of the sisters who come to Sunday school they come without wearing the khimar or without wearing the hijab, and you're asking as a means of clarification, of course, that whether it's an exception because you guys live in the U.S. Of course not. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala said to His Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. يا أيها النبي قل لأزواجك وبناتك ونساء المؤمنين يدنين عليهن من جلابيبهن ذلك أدنى أن يعرفن فلا يؤذين 
Ayah number 59, Surah Al-Ahzab. In this ayah, Allah commanded His Messenger, peace be upon him, to convey the following message as a mandatory duty that all your wives, all your daughters, and all the Muslim women must wear the proper hijab in order to be recognized as believers and, cha and chaste women. When some women came to visit Aisha radiallahu anha, they were from out of town, and one of them was wearing, uh, you know, those uh, see-through, very thin fabric clothes. And she said, well, if you are one of the believers, you should understand that those are not the clothes of the believers. The clothes of the believers do not show what is beneath them. And she started explaining to them. The question is, so this is like, you know, the standard, whether you live in the U.S., whether you live in Tokyo, whether you live in Mecca, it is the same. That women should wear, Muslim women should cover up and wear the hijab, which they wear whenever they offer the prayers. Otherwise, it's not permissible. And the woman is blameworthy. And everybody looks at her and he sees her hair, the v-neck, sees her flesh. She's blameworthy. And she's encountering all those sins. Yes, she's fasting on one hand, and on the other, she's coming to the masjid to teach or to learn or to bring her kid to learn in a Sunday school. This is, uh, you know, big, big conflict in the personality. But what do we do as the executive committee, the management, the imam of the masjid? I would welcome all those sisters. I would not kick them out. I would not kick them off. I would not say, you don't come. Because we open our doors for everyone, even for non-Muslims and for non-practicing Muslims to come and to learn. This strategy, Sister Maya, which I've been following for years, yes, I used to see mothers who would come to drop their kids, they used not even to pray. But over a period of a few months, Alhamdulillah, shukrullah, Wallahi, I believe they, be, they become much better than me myself. That is because it takes time to learn to open up, especially there are a lot of Arab and a lot of Pakistanis, Indo-Pak, who come from their cultures and they were not practicing the deen at all. For years, they were not practicing the deen. They only started practicing their deen in the States or in the UK, believe it or not. Yes, when they see the reverts, when they see those who just accepted Islam and how keen they are to practice their deen. Also, whenever they are afraid that their children may slip away from the deen or their daughter might have, uh, end up having a boyfriend, so they start coming to the masjid to find a solution. We welcome them all. Okay? It doesn't mean that we approve this. It doesn't mean that you are in the U.S. It's okay. The hukm is the same anywhere, whether in Mecca or in your city. But the da'wah requires us to be patient with those people, to warm welcome them and to continue gently giving them the nasiha ad dinu and nasiha our religion is all about paying the sincere advice by that we've come to the end of today's edition of our program ask Uda and love you all brothers and sisters for the sake of Allah happy and blessed Ramadan to all of us and may Allah enable us to witness Laylatul Qadr not while in bed rather while standing up in worship Ameen, Ameen, Ameen do not forget to make lots of dua beginning from today and tonight. Allahumma innaka afuun, tuhibbu al-afwa, fa'afu anna. O Allah, you are the one who pardons and you love to pardon, so pardon all of us. That is the greatest uh, invocation, especially during the last 10 nights of Ramadan. Allahumma innaka afuun, tuhibbu al-afwa, fa'afu anna. Wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Allah is my heart's speech Your mercy is what I beseech Keep in my heart your remembrance And in your deen allow me to advance Help me in my quest Permit me to pass the ultimate test Help me in my quest Permit me to pass the ultimate test Allah is my Mercy is what I beseech. Keep in my heart your remembrance and in your deeds.